Now my big question is, as I'm recording to the cloud, am I recording making the screen smaller and bigger? Is this being captured? I'm having a good time with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I discovered about recordings on Zoom that uh, you can toggle the settings in the back end if you're recording to the cloud, but if you're recording to your own device, it sets it automatically to gallery view. And I don't know how to change that yet. Has anyone else encountered that? I mean, we're gonna get started anyways, but that's just a footnote. Indeed. Well, we're doing that thing where it's like, oh, we're actually giving ourselves that one more minute of entry time. So welcome, welcome to all. Um, and I have my back end set to record gallery and spotlight or yeah, I think it's called spotlight because um, I like to have a couple of different views to, to go from. Hmm. All right, brilliant, my friends. Well, I feel like we should get this party started, even though we know that we might have some late inters. Um, so please, um, I've hit record. Welcome to Producing in Pandemic. I believe this is our 31st session. Oh my gosh, so brilliant. Um, so we are here to uh, share whatever knowledge we have that's going to help us produce through pandemic in pandemic. That includes digital producing as well as the kind of producing skills that allow us to create work in physically shared space, which is why we love that transmedia as a um, overarching term. We're going to invite everyone to introduce yourself, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, let us know, um, um, we do a decolonized greeting. Um, so feel free to do a land acknowledgement. Um, we also do um, non-hierarchical leadership. So we're going to invite you to stack in the chat. Just put your name in the chat. I won't call on you, you'll call on yourself. We're gonna do an access check-in. That's a moment just to let folks know anything the space needs to know to be more accessible to you. Everyone has access needs. And if they're all met, all you do is say, oh, my access needs are met. Um, I will model to begin. And the last piece of that introductory invitation is, let us know what you are working on and what have you observed or learned in the last week that you feel like might be useful to bring back to this gathering. Um, and as always, we will be tracking the time. So if any of us get to that five minute spot of, all right, you're now doing a Hamlet monologue. We'll just put the, the hand up to let us know that it is time to share the microphone with someone else. Um, um, and I, of course, will model to begin. And a big gigantic thank you to my colleagues for putting the um, uh, directions for what we're doing in the chat, as well as a link to our notes. Feel free to go into those notes and uh, drop your links, drop any information that's useful to us. Um, my name is Claudia Alec. My gender pronouns are they, their, she, hers. You can use those interchangeably. I'm speaking to you from the land of the Ohlone people. The people are still alive. I also now take this as a moment to acknowledge I live in a country with concentration camps, and I look forward to that no longer being the case. Um, my practice, I am coming from um, the calling up justice practice. Oh, we're also adding in a visual description Forgive us, we are still working on making sure that that's becoming part of our regular uh, practice. So that visual description is, I'm a black woman, I'm sitting in front of a, a fake background that is a, um, a black box theater with a small Black Lives Matter floating mysteriously in the background. And I have on a gray turban to match my gray Martin Luther King shirt. Um, I have a lot of Martin Luther King shirts. Um, and I'm wearing um, little black uh, gloves to protect my hands. Um, let's see, so um, I'm speaking to you from the Calling of Justice Practice, uh, Transmedia Social Justice Practice. I'm also um, on the board for the Northwest Art Stream. I'm on the advisory board for HowlRound. Um, I'm on the board, uh, co-president of the Board of the Network of Ensemble Theaters. So just doing some national leadership things in different places and trying to keep my eye on what everyone is up to and all the things that we need um, and trying to figure that out. Um, 
my access needs are, I've got my coffee. Um, I have a muscle disorder. So if you see me pull a face, I'm not pulling a face at you. Um, um, but I have been feeling a little, um, the smoke in the air has been making me feel a little uh, congested. So just be drinking water. That feels like that's a thing. Um, and the project or the thing, other than that, all of my access needs are met. And the thing that I've been observing this week is I'm still continuing to try and figure out what are some of the solutions to inconsistent access to equipment for individual practitioners. If we're living in a society that has extreme wealth disparity, that means oftentimes, and, and if we're moving to a place where it's going to be an expectation that individuals show up with their own lighting system, their own sound system, and their own camera capture system. I'm like, wow, you've just made the bar higher for individual, the financial bar higher. What are we doing to, um, to solve that problem? And I had an amazing conversation with the New York Public Library. They've got this really cool project that they're working on where they have these kits and the kit will have an iPad and a microphone and a little light, little ring light. And um, everybody gets to have them in the mail. No, no, you don't get them in the mail. You have to come up and you have to pick them up in person. Then you get to use it for a full month. You return it. It's quarantined for four days, cleaned, and then the next person gets to have it for a month. And they were able to get 80 kits. I am excited to find out what they learn. They're planning on, knock on wood, launching that program in like, um, um, in November, but potentially it will get launched in December because they're still learning. Um, and then it's supposed to happen for a full year. So I'm just, I'm curious about what are other things that could be launched or piloted right now to help solve this problem because I feel like we need to come at it from a lot of different directions. All right, that's my that's the end of my long check-in. Check. Thanks, Claudia. Tanya, they, them, uh, calling in from the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat Haudenosaunee, uh, Mississauga of the New Credit, Anishinaabe, um, and Patoon folks in what's colonially known as Toronto. You see me looking out the window because I'm thinking of the physical land uh, as I'm doing a land acknowledgement. Joining just uh, uh, my access need is to leave at 125 sharp, but wanted to see your lovely faces and hear your voices today. Um, oh, and I, I will drop a link in the notes to a production that I'm supporting on Thursday, which is uh, someone who we've had the, the pleasure of visiting the space, Christina Wong for Public Office. If you haven't seen her show that she's touring, uh, Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and that's with uh, Art to Action, Andrea South in Tampa Bay, Florida. So it'll be neat to hear that dialogue as it's emerging. Um, and actually, just to frame back to Claudia, because I'm feeling a little scattered and overwhelmed uh, sort of generally today, but getting, getting granular about some stuff is sort of helping me to build momentum. So I, I do happen to know that in the Toronto Public Library, there is a rental device uh, program, mostly MiFi. So I think it functions like Wi-Fi, but could be used as a broader network. Uh, so not just for one household, uh, but you have one person who signs up and they've partnered with organizations and it's a year long rental period uh, with a library card. And uh, so if you have that access need, um, they're providing, and I think it's more than 100 units, but I don't have all the details. But just to say, I'm glad that folks are thinking about what the barriers to access can be. Um, particularly as waves of, you know, opening and shutting down places like libraries. Uh, where folks may have access to Wi-Fi uh, are unavailable, and even the subway in to a certain degree. Um, so that's great. And I've also been thinking about it working in the nonprofit sector, like we used to think of honorariums or food and tokens to, to get to and from events as ways to reduce barriers to access. But I, I really think that reframing that and adding on, and in some cases reallocating that funding uh, to to reduce barriers to access could be used for devices. Um, and I've, yeah, I've been talking with people about how that can be possible and uh, seeing some inspiring small steps. So that's, uh, that's it from me today, Rebecca E. I remember you're next. Thanks, Tanya. I'm Rebecca Ennels. I use she, her pronouns. I am zooming in from the unceded traditional lands of the Ramaytush, Ohlone people. Um, 
colonially known, um, I'm on Mount Davidson, part of what's now known as San Francisco, um, a lovely mountain, which I have done some great hiking on in the last few days with the clean air, um, appreciating picking some blackberries with my kids, um, late season. <laughs> so um, what else? Access needs are pretty good right now, it should be fine. Um, uh, visual, I'm going to practice that because it's new to me. I'm a white woman wearing glasses. I have long brown hair. I am in a office space with a bookshelf behind me um, and I'm wearing an orange dress. Um, discoveries of, oh, I'm with San Francisco Shakespeare Festival. I'm the artistic director. I'm doing a lot of digital producing. Um, things I enjoyed this week. I listened to It Can't Happen Here with the, the Berkeley Rep broadcast. We were one of the broadcasting partners. It was immensely powerful and I now have this really new love, of, like new appreciation return to love for radio plays. I also really liked how they did it in 30 minute episodes. So I did episode one and then I served the kids dinner, got them to bed, did episodes two, three, four, and I was, I was actually planning only to do like a second episode and then I couldn't stop listening and I actually listened and watched the whole talk back as well. So loved it. It's up until November 9th. It's, I had seen it in person and, and you know, even if you haven't seen it in person, it's really well done. I'm looking forward to more radio plays done that way. I also got to see a reading of our friend Mickey Goldhaber's play, um, the, the, um, the, the one about the restoration women lady scribblers. So I know that she's mentioned it before and she had a little inv invitation reading on Zoom this week and it was such a wonderful play. And so the language is delightful. So that was really fun to listen to. Um, the challenge that I, that I am dealing with along with a lot of equity theaters, we got we, um, sag after threw down this last week and said, we have jurisdiction on all, anything with a camera or a microphone. Equity then sent letters to its membership saying, don't sign SAG contracts for, the, for theater, for what we consider to be theater work. Um, we, are, we are going to fight this. We want our membership to stay theater artists doing virtual theater. So the plot thickens. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm actually pretty grateful that we did stick by AEA this last summer and did not go to SAG because now I'm hearing from other theaters that they are getting not exactly cease and desist letters, but memos from from uh, equity saying you got to break up your relationship with SAG or there's going to be problems going forward. So we shall see uh, what happens now. And that's me. Okay, I believe it's me next. Uh, hola, everybody. I am Carlos Alexis Cruz. I am calling from the land of the Catawba and Sugary people or Charlotte, North Carolina. I also bring my Latino and indigenous heritage from my island, Puerto Rico, and the Taino indigenous people, uh, always with me. Um, I'll be having my camera off a lot today because I've realized that I've been spending too much time in front of the computer and my body is aching in ways that I'm not used to. Uh, you guys know I'm a, primarily a physical theater and circus practitioner, so my body is, this is, this is, is starting to rebel. So I'm going to multitask and I'm going to be fully present, but I'm going to be fully stretching on the floor and whatnot. So like that's what's happening. Uh, um, but yeah, that doesn't mean that does, I'm here. <laughs> um, when I turn on my camera on, uh, then you'll be able to see my full self, which is uh, this uh, brown male uh, with a bandana, black bandana on and a blue shirt on the, in front of, the, of a blue uh, wall and some Puerto Rican pictures of El Morro, uh, which is, a, well, that's a symbol of colonized Puerto Rico right there, but it's also emblematic of our island. It's problematic, but culturally close. I don't know how to say, <laughs> what else to say um, from that. Um, I am uh, I, I, I am the producing artistic director of the New Music Project. Uh, circus Project is a circus company. Now we have a, a performance outside a schedule as part of a We Are a Hip Hop event in November. And there was a festival in Charlotte this past uh, weekend. And I'm just very intrigued. I don't know how, what's going to happen with, you know, audiences outside. Like uh, cases are rising in North Carolina. Um, so, you know. And also, uh, I'm very intrigued. The school system started with this kids at school today. So I'm just, uh, that whole variable is uh, really weighing a lot on me today. Um, so, you know, 
we at Charlotte, my university, started uh, in person two weeks ago, and we have uh, clusters of, uh, you know, uh, in a couple of dorms and basketball team and the football team. So, uh, you know, here we go. Uh, I'm just saying that's kind of what mentally I'm at today. I'm trying, we will continue to do our best, but then, you know, as people, as communities, we seem to struggle in keeping uh, or getting a hold of this. So, um, so on that note, I'm very happy to be part of this cohort as in every Monday and I'll continue to be and I'll pass it to the next person as I'll begin my stretching section here. Uh, I'll be in. Hi, Sabrina Hamilton here. I use she, her, hers. I am coming to you from the traditional lands, the Pakamtuk and Nipmunk people here in what's now known as Western Massachusetts. Um, I am a, uh, I have shoulder length white hair, very pale skin, a peacock blue sweater that matches the walls of the office space I'm in, and dark green glasses. Um, I work as the artistic director of the Co Festival of Performance, but this week, um, with anxiety about rising COVID cases due the, to UMass um, and uh, to the election stress and the coming winter, um, which I am going to have to grapple with. I have been mainly outside uh, working on my land, uh, ameliorating the soil, trying to continue the tradition of stewardship um, by our Native American uh, rightful owners of this land. Um, but I have been, uh, so I've been mainly outside this week and I have to say being away from obs obsessive screen use has been um, very rewarding. And I think I'm gonna just let it lie fallow until after the election. Um, and I think, uh, Alyssa, I believe that you are next. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, my name is Elissa Stebbins. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am speaking to you from uh, the lands of the Ramatush and Ohlone people, colonially known as St. Francisco. Um, I am a white woman sitting in a living room. So behind me is a couch and a chair and a plant and a blue wall, a white woman with bangs and glasses. Um, I, 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 I judge I don't have a lot to share this week in terms of challenges or, or um, learnings. So I'm really glad to be here and hear all of yours. Uh, and I think that's all for me. I will pass it on to Mars. Hi, um, I'm Mars Wolf. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm calling in from the land of the Seminole people in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida. Um, I'm currently in a room with um, a beige wall. There are some images around. Um, I'm wearing a red and blue shirt and a blue head wrap. Um, I am uh, also the uh, producer of Decipher, a digital salon that uh, curates work from uh, black and brown artists created during quarantine. Um, I think, the, oh, Padlet. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I had to, I did a timeline this weekend and it was like, I was putting it off for the longest time and Padlet came into my life and I was like, oh, this is like kind of fun. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I think that's all for me and I will pass it along to Shireen. Thanks Mars. Uh, my name is Shireen Azov. I am, uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from uh, traditional Anishinaabe land, colonially known as um, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, let's see, I am a mixed Egyptian and European woman with, uh, I would say, olive skin and very long dark brown hair that's being 
uh, styled into a side braid today. I am wearing a uh, red hoodie and I'm in the host of people office, which is in my house that has a uh, chalkboard and a whiteboard behind me and a sleeping um, pit mix to my right and behind me um, named Juna uh, and she is dark brown. Uh, let's see, I, um, hmm. I've been having lots of challenges and also lots of uh, good, rich things happening. I think that's kind of the, the way of the world at the moment. Um, I am, I've, I'm working on a show uh, called Kilobatra that is um, a really sort of, it's after the, a play called um, Death of Cleopatra written by uh, Egyptian poet and playwright, playwright Ahmed Shakwi and we have a design meeting tonight. We have a reading next week. I'm have challenges with casting. I've you know I have challenges with schedules, um, and it's the it's going to happen on Zoom. And but it, and it's uh, it's going to be it's going. I'm interested in all of it. So it's good and it's challenging. <laughs> um, uh, and at the same time, I'm also a host of people as co. Um, is working on a project called Trade School Detroit, which is part of a, a project with the Philadelphia thing, which is Trade School is their program, and they partner with the city. Last year it was LA, this year is Detroit, and so a host of people is both a participating artist and a producing partner. So we're getting a cohort of Philly artists and a cohort of Detroit artists and putting them in conversation, and they're gonna um, do work in progress showings in December and January, and then hopefully full showings of work either online or in Philadelphia next year, depending on how things pan out. Um, so I've been working a lot on that and figuring out how we're going to do those showings online. Um, uh, yeah, so feel very busy on top of never feeling like I'm doing enough for this election all at the same time. So there's just like, as other people have said, that level of anxiety just, you know, rising. Um, but I think that's it for me. I'm so glad to be here when I can fit this in. It's one of the things that I really brings me a lot of, um, I think, information and joy. So I will pass it on to Rebecca P. Thanks. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, I'm Rebecca Pingree. Uh, she, hers. I am speaking to you from the uh, unceded territories of the Chochenyo Ohlone people, colonially known as Berkeley, California. Uh, my access needs are just coffee today and water, and I have those things. Uh, I am a uh, white woman with uh, pandemic roots uh, in my auburn side braided hair. Uh, I am wearing an olive top, and I am sitting in my bedroom uh, in front of a, a cornucopia of, of weird artist items, masks, a vintage suitcase propping up my full length mirror, uh, and also the normal things that go in a bedroom like my dresser. Um, uh, I am the co-founder of Analog Theater with Elissa Stebbins, who's also here today. Um, and the, the main challenge that I have been working on in and amongst so, so many festive challenges are um, uh, trying to figure out how PR, uh, especially images, works in this time where what I'm finding is that uh, we, we have an event coming up um, kind of late November uh, and it is a, a amalgamation of uh, live, digital performance, pre-recorded uh, performance out in the world, and also a conversation with the audience. And when you have that kind of multifaceted event, uh, what, I'm, what I've been noticing is that my, uh, usually my assignment in creating PR posters or graphics or whatever is very straightforward. You have an image that is what the thing looks like and then you work around that. But with this, because it's multiple things, um, the things that feel like the most accurate representation of what it is are the least aesthetically pleasing things to show people. And the things that are the most aesthetically pleasing look like 
oh, that's just people not in COVID out in the world. Like I'm going to watch a movie and you're like, yeah, no, it's, it's, that's not what the event is. That's what this tiny, tiny piece of the event is. Um, and so struggling with what are some things that I can do with the images um, or are there images that can be created that are specifically um, the thing I've been playing with is trying to create images that are taking elements of those things and then able to like put them side by side with the thing that feels like a polished uh, example of what it is. I'm sorry that that was a woo type of explanation of, of what that issue is. But anyway, it's clearly a struggle that's very active with me right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, and that's me. And I think it's Khalid next. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, uh, my name is Khulud Salaf, and uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm speaking to you from the ancestral homeland of the Osage, the Caddo, and the Kuapa people, uh, which is known as Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, my access needs that I'm just having my coffee. I am a, a visual description. I am a Middle Eastern woman from Syria, from Damascus. Uh, uh, so I have olive uh, skin and I wear a hijab, which is the Islamic uh, head cover. And I'm wearing a red turtleneck uh, top with a background of a mosque from Damascus behind me and on a blue couch. And my headscarf is also blue. Uh, access needs, I talked about the coffee. Uh, what else? I'm part of the Calling Up Justice uh, producing team and uh, exciting to be here always. Uh, challenges this week, I'm actually trying to set up a studio for my dad in Canada. And like, I, it's, just, it's a very funny challenge to be like, okay, what is the size of this space? What color is this? How do I do this? I mean, aside from the pandemic, there is a uh, I can't travel because of the Muslim ban, so please vote. Thank you so much. <laughs> and with that, I'm passing it back to you. Yeah. yeah. I think we did our intros, I believe, unless we have anyone else who, oh, great, Mona, yes. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Mona Jean, I use she, her. Uh, I'm coming from the uh, Tongva people's home in Los Angeles, California. I was invited here by Tanya. Um, it feels very strange to be sitting here in my office, my inter, there she is, oh my God. Um, I'm sitting in my interpreting environment, which is a purple plain background, appropriate lighting, dark plain, background of clothes. I noticed I, got, I wasn't working, so this is what I was wearing this morning. And uh, I got on here and like, oh my God, that is horrible for interpreting. So um, I'm a, a mature woman uh, with reddish pinkish hair, um, asymmetrical, long braid side. Um, I met Tanya because I am the resident interpreter for the Poetry Slams. I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, uh, I also have produced my own company, which is a sign dance company. Uh, we're going to have a show on October 30th. It's going to be virtual. And we um, use dances and sign languages from all around the world. So we're going to have Israeli dancers with Israeli sign, Ethiopian dancers with African dance and sign. Um, we're going to have our Aztec dancers using the LS LSM, um, Mexican Sign Language, and they're going to give us a, a blessing, a Dia de las Muertes blessing, and um, a bunch of other signing and dancing from Hawaii and Toronto. Um, remember Juan from Toronto? And he did that monster, the, the dance, the monster. Were you there for that? Oh, my God. Everybody was just in tears. Um, so anyways, uh, <laughs> truly, um, uh, deaf sign dancer, just marvelous. Um, so um, I'm I'm here. I would like to be a resource to all of you. I've uh, been interpreting. I am RID certified, so you can trust and not worry about troubles. Um, I uh, I've been interpreting for 25 years. 
I've been doing this VRI, virtual remote interpreting, since March, you know, when it hit and the world went like this. And, um, and so everybody scrambled to figure out what to do. And a, a, a funny thing was one of the first people that really hired me and um, uh, or through an agency was Herbalife. And they had a huge conference that they needed to get up and online and running quickly. So um, they had uh, like 30,000 people connected and viewing their thing. Um, and that we used the beginning of Zoom. That was what, uh, the program that we used, the platform that we used. And um, since it has evolved and has become much better for sign language interpreters, um, we're able to, because now you can pin multiple things and this has been a problem for, especially in the school systems, when the teacher wants to share her screen, that spotlight goes away. And so the deaf student is either, well, I can look at the screen or I can look at the interpreter. And sometimes they don't even have that choice because the teacher's in control. So, um, you know, and um, believe me, I've worked on uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google, blah, blah, blah. There's a, one called Canvas, Jitsi. There's, there's like everybody, and people are inventing their own. Orange County in LA, oh my God, Orange County Community College, they have their own platform, which every time I get on it, it just messes with my whole system. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot you can do. There's a lot you shouldn't do. Um, I would love to be a resource to, to y'all. I've been interpreting, like I said, everything from um, <laughs> Herbal Life with 30,000 international people to um, the, the, the school down the street with the seven-year-old hearing girl with two deaf moms. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, really everything, um, psychological evaluations, work trainings, doctor's appointments, a lot of poetry, because I'm out there in the poetry community, um, some theater, um, and, you know, and I've been producing my own virtual sign dance classes, and I'm going to do the show in October. Um, I'm putting my information in the um, chat. And um, so, you know, I mean, uh, that's why Tanya, Tanya invited me to uh, just be a resource. So I'm here if you need. I'd love to be involved in some of your shows that you all there were doing, Elisa and, and Rebecca and, and uh, for, you know, so just you guys um, use me and um, I, I don't need much. I'm like, I, I got my, my coffee and I, I can I can help her answer questions. So what a great group, you guys. Fabulous Brilliant. idea. Good Thank idea. you so much, Mona. Uh, also, I don't know if you noticed for this entire, uh, uh, while I was listening to all the intros, I was doing this on one device and this on another. I uh, Every time we meet, I'm trying to get our captioning to work. Still, still oh. failing, still failing, my friends. For some oh. reason, it wants to pull from Otter AI and I'm like, I'm no longer working with Otter AI. Ah. Um, but we also recognize that because we are sharing our work asynchronously, um, the YouTube will be captioned. But inside today's meeting, we are still failing to have auto captioning inside the meeting. Um, Mona, we want to know with a warning with your the, the um, YouTube auto caption, you know. Exactly. But Mona, I, we want to we wanna, um, um, get all of the different flavors of your practice. So I want to slow you down and say, Mona, introduce us to like who you are as a person and as a human being. <laughs> Where are you located on this planet? What is your practice? I mean, I know that I did a bunch of research on you and got, got all up into websites, but like, do you want to share your screen, share your, uh, share your company so we can see um, the, the, the work that you're, that you're talking about? Because that everyone's in the chat. Everyone's super excited about, the, about October 30th. So like, first, I want to just say, let's, let's, let's celebrate you and your art and look at that practice. I want to know more about that. I think it's deeply exciting to have artistic practices that are centering access in the disabled community. Well, yeah, you guys are so sweet. I, you know, I love Tanya. 
they are just the best um always always gives me much love so whenever she they ask i will i whatever yes i i always what do you yes you know so um okay i'm gonna pull this up here but it's just it's not really um we can do this um okay where am i over here so uh i am in like i said the tongva um land it was los angeles i've lived here for uh a years and I, i'm a better professional interpreter for 25 years so i am rid certified um i've been freelance most of that all of that time um i which means every day i do something different and i've been doing that for a long time um i uh i've always danced and then i got into the poetry community and um so i also create uh, sign language poetry so i i write you know there's english and then there's asl and it's totally different it's a different grammar it's a different syntax it's a different morphology uh we don't have a to be verb am is our was we're be being them there's none of that it, it follows romantic languages where concrete you have to have something before you can um adjectives on it um, so when I started, you know, interpreting, it's like you have frozen English text and then you take this ASL and you kind of bastardize it and, and make it fit. But I thought, oh, wouldn't it be better if you could just like kind of craft them so that they went together. And so then I was hooked. So I've been doing that a lot. But being a dancer, I also started um, choreographing with signs because sign language is a dancing language, you know. So uh, I started choreographing with signs and then I realized and not a lot of people do know this but um, if you think and you understand language is related to culture so if you change the culture you change the language and you know in American sign here's the what one of the things they use in American sign language this means man because this was his hat this means woman because her hat had strings on it okay and in Asian countries, most Asian countries, this is man because he's the biggest, the strongest, the first. And this is woman because she's the smallest, the weakest, the last. So language is related to culture. So, um, you know, American Sign Language has more in common, more roots with French Sign Language than it does with British Sign Language. British Sign Language is its own system, separate, totally. They wanted to create their own they didn't want to borrow from the french who had a perfectly wonderful elegant solution but um and when america wanted to set up their first deaf school they sent somebody over to britain to learn and they're like well you know you got to hang out here for like five six seven years and they'll teach you and, da, 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 da. and the guy the rich guy with the deaf daughter who was paying for this professor to go over there he's like I'm not paying for you to live in England for five years so the guy said hey you know France Paris has this school so he went over there and they were just like oh we oui, c'est bon. and they you know invited him in taught him and sent back their top student back to America to help set up the school the clerk so um America has sign language has very strong roots in French sign language um bon. so um a few years ago, I started, I, I set up a America a ASL cabaret, and it was a celebration of performing artists. And everything was totally inclusive. And we said performing artists because we didn't want to say a, a deaf artist. So we had hearing, deaf, sign. If you signed, you could be on our stage. And we started at my friend's punk dive bar, and I mean punk dive bar. And then after five years, we were at the Beverly Hills Annenberg Theater for the Performing Arts. And in that time, we had everybody in the deaf community on our stage. We had Marley Matlin. Probably don't know who Bernard Bragg is, but he's like the king of, <laughs> of deaf theater in the whole wide world. He was on our stage. He was my mentor. We had Sean Forbes, the deaf rapper from Detroit. <laughs> Yeah, and um, the whole cast and crew from Spring Awakening on Broadway, the whole cast and crew from Switched at Birth on NBC TV. So we had all of these people and, um, you know, and, and I just, I, I had to walk away. 
but I went back to my roots, which is signs and dance. So now I have this company and um, we're gonna have our, our class, uh, this one right here, uh, our show, here we go. So this is, um, this is Jill and Aman. She is hearing, he is deaf, they live in Israel. They're going to do two pieces for us and both of them use Israeli sign language. We're going to um, have one from Toronto, uh, who's deaf, Norman from Hawaii. He's, uh, he's what we call a coda. So he's a child of deaf adults. So his signing is spectacular. He's gonna do, uh, somebody's watching you. Somebody's watching me. Um, we're going to have, um, well, I'm just trying to pull this up. Um, oh, Hana Tawabe from Ethiopia. She's deaf. She's going to be doing Ethiopian sign language. Fabulous Ethiopian dancing. She's just, and, and gorgeous. Um, we're going to have Megan who's a deaf scientist, but she also likes to dance. So she's going to be doing uh, Witchy Women. Uh, I already told you we have Alma with the Aztec group. They're gonna do us a blessing with Mexican Sign Language. Um, we're gonna have Mary Chang. She's a belly dancer. She is hearing, she's a belly dancer. She's using Bauhaus, Goth, Bella Lugosi's dad <laughs> and sign language. And. Uh, and, and how do we, so I see that, that, that you're sharing a Facebook page. Is that the best way for us to contact or, or, or connect to your practice through this Facebook uh, event? Um, yeah, the Facebook event is here. Um, I'm going to put this back. I'm going to put this link in the thing. In, my, in the chat, uh, I've, oh, I got to stop sharing screen. That's what's the problem with. In the chat, I've put my, um, my, Oops, uh, some of my information. This is my website. Uh, here's the Facebook link. Um, that's for the, the event. Um, my phone number. Uh, yeah, also, I would like to say that um, my, my team interpreter for the slams which you cannot do something like that or many things of any length without a good team interpreter anything over two hours please get two interpreters don't think that one interpreter is going to be able to just keep processing two languages at the same time and keep a wonderful output message for any length of time without it breaking down um, but my my woman moxie uh, he, she, her, she's in um, Atlanta and we, through her instigation and her desire, are going to set up, uh, it's called, it's going to be called virtual lingual. So we are going to focus on only virtual sign language interpreting. So we're gathering a crew, we're meeting with our web developer at five o'clock this evening. And um, so we want to, and you know, she has a way strong background in performance theater. She owns the contracts for most of the theaters in Atlanta. Her husband's a musician. My husband's a musician. My husband um, does keyboards. He traveled with a band that opened for the police on their first world tour. And then he went, he, uh, he started out as a cellist, so he has like the classical background, and then he composed music for the Bolshoi Circus for one of their tours. And so um, we work together. Now he does something called circuit bending. I, I don't know uh, uh, if you have ever heard of that. You take a kid's toy, a Casio keyboard, speak and spell, something, you open it up you with the circuits, and now it goes, <laughs> it makes really weird noise. And um, we have a marching band for that, um, and we compose together. So, thank you for your your kind interest. And um, classes, yeah, classes at six, and then the show will start at seven. Okay, so come to the class at six. I'm gonna teach you some thriller moves, and um, some of the sign languages. Thriller, da, da, da. and then. 
we'll have the show will start at seven with all the performers. And at the end of the show, the dancers in the class, the students from the class are gonna perform Thriller. So you can be in the show too. Um, please help us spread the word. Um, uh, the show will be recorded. I probably will throw it up on um, my, my YouTube um, link, page, channel, that's what it is. Um, so um, yeah, you know, I mean, um, I'm going to do my, my next project is um, a piece that it's going to be for the holidays. It was supposed to be for the Los Angeles Music Center holiday celebration. But things, you know, these are the nature of things they get. So, um, but I'm still gonna do this. Uh, <laughs> that's so cute. Um, so I've written a piece called Celebration and I'm trying to gather as many sign languages as I have, I have six so far. So what I'm gonna try to do is the piece is the same. It's like a, a two minute poem dancey kind of thing. And every week, it, starting in November, I'm going to teach the same piece with a different sign language. Okay, and then, and then for the holiday, we will perform it all together. I don't know how. I haven't gotten that far. We'll figure it out. Who's going to dance? What was it going to be? I don't know. But so that's. Well, I do want to make sure um, now oftentimes um, I will pop in in between the moment where we do our introductions and uh, to do to do a more fulsome introduction to you, but also to talk about all the other stuff that we always want to talk about. So I'm going to take that moment right now to acknowledge that we brought up some juicy stuff in the introductions and please know we have been prepping for it. So Danny couldn't make our meeting today, but we had a huge conversation about, okay, what's the conversation this group needs to talk about in terms of equity, SAG-AFTRA? What is the work that we're doing? And what does equity mean for us? Um, how are uh, some of the choices that SAG-AFTRA, what are some of those choices doing that are creating outcomes of inequity for people in our field? What do we actually need? That feels like a very important conversation for us to have. Um, so we, we decided it was too much for this meeting. We were like, we're not sure even how to get into it. So next week, that's what we wanna talk about. We wanna talk about the concept of equity, not necessarily the union that is equity. The concept of equity and the concepts of like, what do we actually need to be fighting for? What do we need? Hollywood is, is a, uh is aware, I, you know, I mean, Hollywood is a buzz. Um, there are people that are, will not let Hollywood just ig ignore it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, it's in their topic. I mean, it's on their, their board. It's for them. So, um, yes, it's good. Indeed. I also just wanted to do a shout out. Sometimes I say this out loud, sometimes I don't. Shout out for our relaxed meeting style. I, it, it's on purpose. Um, for many of us, we are leading fully digital lifestyles because we're in full quarantine and we can't be out there in the world. So what are the different smart things we're doing to extend our ability to be able to continue collaborating with people through these digital interfaces. And it feels like having your screen off for a certain portion of the day. It's useful, it actually has your body behave in different ways inside your space. When I turn the screen off, I'm fully engaged in listening to you, but suddenly I'm doing things with my arms and I'm doing other things with my body that just feel healthy and good. So just shout out for that. That was just a smart thing. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, but next week, we definitely want to talk about SAG-AFTRA, equity, transmedia. Also, how does this impact the work that we are sharing on these digital, different digital platforms and social media? Like, where does TikTok live in this? Where does a YouTube channel live in this? Um, I can't wait to talk about it. Please bring everything next week, though. Let's have a, let's have a big old messy conversation. I'm excited about it. Um, um, returning back to Mona being here, though, I feel like we have a moment to have some conversations around um, 
how artistically, how are we trying to attempt to include uh, sign interpretation? What are some of the challenges that we found? Like Mona, you listed like 20 different fabulous platforms, right? I wanna slow us down and actually talk about, are there, are there other platforms that are better or is Zoom actually the one that really is the best for, um, for, for giving multiple modes of access? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give us a chance to have a real conversation about sign interpretation uh, with Mona here so we can ask you all the questions. Please ask me questions. Really, please ask me questions. Um, one of the um, Zoom right now is just like, it's the standard. And especially since they've um, done this most recent upgrade that's allowed you to um, highlight more than one screen. And um, uh, it's good because it gives more control to the deaf person, which is always what we want to do is empower the deaf person. So many times the powers that be, the oppressive, you know, are, make all the decisions for the deaf people being very, you know, patri uh, patronic, patronic, what is it, what am I calling it? Um, uh, so patriarchal. Um, yeah, so be aware of, of the decisions that you're making without your deaf community involved, I would say. Um, and Zoom, like I, it's just the standard right now. Um, deaf are really used to it. Um, they've even kind of abandoned Skype for Zoom now. One of the things that um, made Zoom accessible and stuff was their $14.99 monthly charge and that allows you to have unlimited time and up to 100 participants. So that's a very cheap, reasonable account to get to provide access. Um, if you are going to have an interpreter, please note background. And, you know, I, I'm so embarrassed with this, <laughs> actually. It's, I just, this morning is like, I'm not going to be an interpreter and I get to wear what I want, you know, and this is what I threw on this morning. Um, do try to get someone that's certified. Where's my thing going in and out? Um, my camera's going in and out. Just a minute. I have a question if you have a moment. Oh, please. Yes, yes. I'd rather do that. So at the co-festival, we've done some of the traditional ASL interpretation with the with the interpreter on the side or interpreters on the side. Um, and we've presented Quest Theater Company and Visual Theater where there is no sign language, but the shows are entirely visual, which also gives you access for people who don't have English or uh, or a common language with, uh, with the performers and the audience. Um, but the other thing that we've done a lot of, particularly with Pilgrim Theater, another net theater company, um, is, uh, is uh, shadowing so that the interpreter will be on stage with the actors um, shadowing them. Often they've done a lot of productions where the actors have been in costume, where the interpreters have been in costume. One of the most interesting things I found directorially was when the actor was doing text, the interpreter was acting subtext and oh. signing text. Yeah. So you were seeing sort of the inner life of a character through yeah. the interpreter. Um, so it was a yes and rather than a sort of side by side. It was a, you know, like if I had a choice to see that bad. performance or a performance that was not interpreted, I would choose to see that performance. Um, yeah. well, that, so that, yeah, the more uh, so are there are there ways to sort of to 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 do things like that 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 keep it from sort of the, that make it more dramatic or more exciting than than some of the the sort of more business kinds of interpreting yeah. um uh of course you know when you can incorporate the language into the production that, that's always best um and you know i would also be careful about when you have that interpreter and they put it on the side you know, and now the deaf person is doing this kind of thing, you know, um, that, you know, stage people or directors, they, they, they have no idea. Well, we went, and the actors would sometimes prefer them to be as far over there, you know, without stealing the spotlight. Um, and um, just an aside, I did 
take theatrical interpreting on Broadway at the Juilliard School in New York, New York City. So I have that set of skills and training. Um, but are there particular ways that people are using this, are dealing with this in the online format that you've encountered? You know, there's not a lot that's being done, um, especially because everything is so separate in separate boxes. Um, Deaf West isn't doing anything right now, and they're the ones that really, you know, really champion that. On if you saw Spring Awakening and their production on Broadway, that is just, you know, that their interpreter is also another character right. who will speak and then become the, you know, the voice and like that. I mean, at um, least now we can reorder the boxes in a way that we couldn't a while ago in Zoom, <laughs> so that you yeah. can do more that way. And then we saw last week the sort of frame of audience people and the the centered. Uh, for, but are there are there any other sort of artistic innovations is what I'm worrying, wondering about. You know, if you have the time and you have the rehearsal, uh, the, that the, the hearing, the interpreter and the deaf person could work together, you know, rehearse in their own themes that they can interact. I would suggest that. And that's one of the things that we're kind of well, that's one of the things I'm doing with, with Norman um, is we're playing with, you know, somebody's watching me, you know, I mean, we're playing with using the camera and developing the, the space. So um, I would say that could be um, something that would, that would be creative. A anything, you know, but it, again, you know, the rehearsal of, of having the two people and having them uh, have that that interaction, that rehearsal. I'd love to see what you're doing, Sabrina. Please hit me up. Let's do, you know, I mean, we can share resources, talents, crafts, creations, you know. Um, there's a lot out there going. People are trying, you know. I mean, we're all just trying. Um, there have been a few virtual shows in the deaf community. Um, one of the things that's hard when you're dealing with virtual performances and deaf, a lot of deaf are hard of hearing. A lot of deaf like music or the place that music holds in our culture. You know, music is, has, has a, a big strong place in our culture and a lot of them, maybe they don't hear the music but they are part of that, that culture, the hip hop, the dress, the Twitter, the, you know, TikTok, the, all of that that's involved, the YouTube videos, <laughs> YouTube videos, um, they're, they're very much involved in that. Now, when you start using music on your laptop, that's your speaker. <laughs> Deaf when they do do music they want bass they want it loud and they want it to feel it and so um if you have any way possible you know uh, get some big bass but it's it, your bass is not going to matter because it's only going to be limited by the person who's receiving it their speaker system and we had an artist who was uh, who joined one of our sessions, I want to say four or five sessions ago, who was talking about the use of haptics, um, which I think might be some very interesting, I mean, it's early, early days for all of this work, right? So I just want to do a shout out um, and amplification for your question, Sabrina, because I actually think it's a really vital question because it feels so easy to just add captions at the bottom. It's plain text, but like, what's the artistic choice? Could it be as simple as, is, is the caption, uh, do you have your captions taking place with a different font choice? Um, um, do you have the captions taking place in different places on the screen? So it's an integrated part of the show rather than this additional extra thing that's tacked on to create accessibility. I, I, I feel like the question you asked was about, oh, how do we integrate yeah. um, accessible design from the beginning of the artistic project rather and than how start do we at the beginning. Something? Yeah, and it needs to start at the beginning, you know, and that's what I'm saying with that rehearsal and the collaboration, you know, with, with your interpreter, with your artist. Even before um, rehearsal. 
I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know as a lighting designer, I get furious when I get brought in at the end after the set design and everything else is already done. I go nuts. Um, and it's much, much, much more interesting if you bring the interpretation in as part of the key collaborators from yeah. the conceptualization, yeah. not just last minute. Yeah. And, and, you know, and like what we were saying with the, um, you know, the way you can frame your interpreter, you know, is your interpreter, you know, or, or are you, you know, things like this, the, how you can frame them, you know, are they over to the, to the side or down in the bottom, you know, because that will also communicate. Uh, right. Like what's visual whispering, what's visual yelling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I'm also just wondering, oh, what would it be like to have an interpreter have two cameras so I could see close-ups of the hands and also a close-up of the face in different boxes? What would that be like? That might be cool. I like that idea, Claudia. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're not talking about is that always that big elephant in the room when it comes to the United States and art making, um, equity and money. Um, uh, I know that one of the reasons why I tend to, for a lot of my projects, I tend to either integrate sign interpretation at the very end of the process is because it was never budgeted for and there's no money for it. And so hope and a wish and a prayer if we're even going to get it. Um, so can we just talk about that for a minute? Like what are the, what are the challenges to us actually effectively integrating sign interpretation into our work? Well, one of the ways that Pilgrims have done it is that Joan Watman is essentially an ensemble member who is their interpreter. And so if, when one thinks about who one wants in one's ensemble, yeah. well, um, one of the, of you. you know, one of the things to consider might be um, people who can provide interesting artistic forms of access. Yeah. And Ooh, that would be Sabrina, you unfair. just said a word. Did y'all just hear what Sabrina just said? I'm just going to repeat out loud what I think I just heard. I think I just heard you suggest that if you want to have an ensemble that's truly functional, you want to include ensemble members who can do sign interpretation. That's exciting. I like that. Or other forms of access provision as well. Mm. My, what I was going to say is your best luck is to find an interpreter that has that artistic heart, you know. And some of the folks, for instance, that Gallaudet put brings fr forth from their theater program. I mean, they're doing wonderful jobs of of training really great theater artists, um, and that has produced Monique Holt. Uh, I mean, all kinds of just yeah. fantastic, fantastic people. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, uh, do a little bit of research and try not, I mean like the interpreter with the artistic heart who's willing to maybe not exactly volunteer because this is our profession too and we want to help, you know, some little stipend, you know, is, is, is uh, appropriate and respectful. Um, uh, be careful about getting the volunteer student interpreter. It's not gonna serve you. Um, also, Could you say more about that. Say more about that. The volunteer student and interpreter, um, they don't have the skills. They just don't have the experience. They don't have the skills. And you're not, if, and, and if you're picking that person and putting them there to provide access for the deaf audience that you're hoping to get, and that deaf audience pays mon money to come and sees this less than providing they're not going to be happy they you you created a negative situation that's going to be hard to erase and mona you were in the middle of a sentence i'm 100 percent interrupting but you had said that you were you're certified what does that mean being a certified interpreter okay we have um a certification body in uh america and it's called rid registry of interpreters for the deaf okay it's nationwide it's actually internationally respected and uh, acknowledged. Um, and you have to pass a test. And it ha it, there's a written test that deals with the ethics and the codes and the culture and the history, a lot of linguistics, 
it's deep. And then there's also the practical test where you have a video, you're in a room with a video and, and a camera. And so the video has a deaf person signing and a hearing person talking. So when the deaf person signs, you speak. And when the hearing person speaks, you sign and they video you. And there's several scenarios and then they sell it, send it out and it's rated by a panel, deaf and hearing and interpreter. So you have to pass this test. It's expensive, it's hard. Most people study for it for several years before they take it. And um, if you pass it, then you're certified. And which means you're kind of legally protected. You have that, that base standard. And a lot of agencies um, will only hire certified interpreters. A lot of um, government contracts and things will only pay for certified interpreters. Um, All right, so Mona, get a contract. Yeah. Mona, I have another question. This is me getting super granular, y'all. Uh, please forgive me. Um, so there's also, um, you're, you're a trained theatrical interpreter, and that's a totally different skill set, too. Can you just talk a little bit about how... Because I, I, I don't think that a, a lay audience actually recognizes that there's a bunch of different types of uh, interpretation. So what does it mean that you're a trained theatrical interpreter? <laughs> well, I do. I have the Juilliard School, the, the theater development one. And I also was very fortunate to go to the National Theater of the Deaf Actors Academy. So they're now, but um, I studied from, and, and they're, school um you know and there's also legal interpreting for the courts and that's a special certification you have to study law and pass a special test for that they make lots of money and when interpreters are starting out that that legal is like that's this goal that people want because it's a lot of money and i was encouraged it's a lot of money but you have to deal with lawyers and, and it's, I, I can't, um, that energy is just, it's adversarial, it's antagonistic, it's linguistic nitpicky thing, it's like verbal, and it's, we're, we're a conceptual language. And I can't do with that. I was a dancer, I grew up dancing, so I went in this direction. You know, they teach you things like, I mean, one of the big things is as an interpreter um, in a theater sense, you are not the star you are the interpreter, you know. I tend, if it's myself, I tend to sign very big, you know, but when I'm the interpreter, you, you bring it in, you pull it down, you know, you're not like, ah, which a lot of interpreters are, and they can't, they don't get this a lot of stuff. And that will piss off your actors a lot if you have this interpreter over there doing all these shenanigans, you know, and, and excessively animated. They need to bring it down, they need to, to pull it in. Um, when I, I am interpreting for the poets, um, you have to do things that are a little bit um, counterintuitive in, in a sense where um, I stage the interpreters upstage of the poet. And I had to fight with people, you know, stage directors and managers for several years before I got any sort of, because if you have this interpreter, one, down and off to the side, that's not good. I'm not standing in the corner. I can't hear. You know, and then if you have them, you know, up in front, the, the, the poet is just, you know, just, I just distracted with this thing going on here. So I put my interpreters upstage in the back. So nobody sees them. I also switch with slam poetry. It's every three minutes and that three minutes can be three minutes of hell, you know, so we switch out after every poem. Um, you need to be back and, and you know, con inconspicuous. You know, we walk on stage where we're, 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 we are down, you know, face down and everything like this so that the audience is looking at the poet as the poet is right there. And then when the poet starts and you get a complete thought, then we can pick up our hands and start signing because you want this, the thing over there. With a deaf audience also, every time the interpreter picks up their hand, the deaf is going to go to the interpreter. So especially like interpreting music or theater, if they're just singing the chorus for the ninth time, oh baby, I want you, you've already signed it seven times, 
you know, you don't have to sign it. If they're saying, oh, you know, and you see interpreters, oh, you know, it's like, no, you know, if they're dancing, let the audience watch the dancing, even if they're singing the same chorus, you know, for the ninth time. Um, there's another controversy a little bit. If you have a band on stage and the sax player is playing the sax, you don't have to do this, you know? Mm. And there's I, a big controversy with that I, right now. All right, know? Mona, I, I, and forgive me. I, I love that I've just gotten all like, like uh, very familiar with you where I'm just calling you by your first name. Please forgive me. I do that. I look at the name on here and I'm just like, I'm just going to say it. Um, I, I have another question and I see Sabrina has her hand up as well. So I was about to go granular again. Sabrina, do you want to ask a um, I just want to correct something that I said before. I did not mean to imply that Gallaudet, for people who don't know it, is a school for interpreters. It's not. It's a deaf culture, deaf college uh, university. So um, just, it, just to make sure that, that folks know that. Yes. Well, oh, oh, so this is my next question. So I've had the pleasure of um, collaborating with mixed deaf and hearing interpreters. And I, in fact, that's my favorite team. I can rarely afford to like have the three to four person team. That's like my ideal. Um, could you, um, I recognize that that's not your specific practice, but do you have experience in that? Can you just talk a little bit about mixed hearing and deaf interpretation teams and how that, wh what that does, how that lives in the scene? Yeah, um, you know, uh, deaf are very familiar with their own language and just, it's a very new phenomenon that started, you know, I'm gonna say five-ish years ago, a little more, but they became certified CDI, certified deaf interpreters. And it's the same organization, RID, is granting these certifications. There are very few out there in the world, very few. Mm. And one of the reasons they were brought in, developed, is mostly if you have deaf with very low language. You know, they've come from Ecuador where they didn't have any deaf schools and they didn't learn Spanish because the parents, you know, I mean, their first language is Spanish on the mouth. You know, their second language might be some Spanish written and then they get to America and they get some ASL or something. But the deaf person is brought in because sometimes some interpreters can't break down the language. They're low enough to a gestural ver visual language because ASL is an actual language and it has grammar. But there's, you know, this big spectrum of signed exact English, ASL, and then you can go on the other side and it's just a gestural language. And I've actually had an international interpreting training, Peter Cook, I've heard of him. But, um, but it's a good, it, it's their language and it's being respectful. If you're going to create things in a sign language, then you want to bring in a native signer is, is kind of the, the idea. You're going to write something in French, you want to have a native French speaker or whatever. Um, it is really cool. It's, it's cool to work with them. I've worked with, with some, some of them are better than others. Um, and, it, and it's good to have, a, you know, they need to have a relationship with the interpreter because sometimes it can be very, there can be friction. Um, each has a role. Um, uh, when you're doing creative stuff, a CDI can be wonderful because they have a wealth, you know, of experience and language that they can figure out how to say things. Um, I know my dancing helps me and I actually um, took Latin was my first language and then French and then Spanish and Japanese. So, but I, I started out as a dancer. So, um, I, I do that body thing. When I was studying at the Juilliard, they would go, you're choreographing your signs, Mona. You're choreographing your signs, which I thought were, we were interpreting a musical. It was Miss Saigon. And I had the opening of the second act where the armies come in and they start taking over. And then another army. And it's like, and, and, but, you know, I mean, it's some of the things you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I had, you know, the older deaf guy going, I don't want to see signs like this. Uh, 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 uh. And then you have the other young deaf girl going, 
that's the music. I want to see the song. That, that's the tempo of the music. I want to see the rhythm of the music. You know, so um, it's, it's a community and you just have to pick your artistic vision, you know, and do, uh, do what you want to create. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you saying that, Mona Jean. And now I just de said, de decided that I'm calling you by your first and your middle name again. Just Mona Jean would be cool. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. um, but and like, I, I sign as Mona Jean if you need it. M J because of the oh, M J M J. All right. Um, I think it's very important for us to remember that no community is homogenous. There's the big deaf, big, the deaf community with a big D, deaf community with a little D. So you've got like the, you've got the disabled community with the big D, the disabled community with a little D. Um, there's a lot of flow between these communities, folks who have acquired um, a community membership and then folks who, um, um, who were born into the community. So there's just a lot of different layers and opinions. Um, I also do want to say out loud that the politics of certification and verification in the United States are so complicated and racialized. Um, so I, I go, oh, that's a, that's a layer. But also, you do want to make sure that you're working with folks who are legitimately able to help you with your communication needs. So you got to make sure that you're actually partnering with folks who can actually do the thing you're asking them to do, which is why I brought up the difference between someone who's been, for instance, uh, as Mona Jeans uh, had said, that uh, trained in like um, legal sign interpretation is actually a very different exercise than asking someone to interpret a poem. Two different skill sets. So just, we really appreciate you bringing your expertise and knowledge to this conversation. Um, now, someone dropped this into the chat and I thought, well, we should just have a quick look at this. This is um, Cutting Ball Theater's production of Utopia. Um, look at this, it's a virtual world premiere because it's streaming now. Oh, wait, I didn't mean to do that. I did not mean to go. That's annoying, Cutting Ball. Why'd you make me do that? Okay, all right find out about the play what it's about i do like this look at this you want to just give someone the gift of getting to see it so they can see it for free isn't that smart i love that all right talking about all the folks that they worked with to create the piece the how to stream and then we're getting to this section which is the part we were interested in accessibility yeah. so to ensure deaf and blind audience may experience the virtual world premiere Cutting Ball Theater is offering uh, Utopia with access options, a version with captions, a version with ASL interpretation, and a version with audio description. And it seems like these are literally different ways of experiencing the work, which I find fascinating. I also feel like that for one of our um, upcoming meetings, we should invite someone who does the labor of visual descriptions, because like creating a visual description script, that exercise is an artistic project in and of itself as well. Um, and it looks like uh, access services were offered in partner with Gravity Access Services and a consultation from Urban Jazz Dance Company, of course, Urban Jazz Dance Company. That's your hometown, uh, Oakland. Yes. Do you know Urban Jazz? Do you know Antoine? Antoine Hunter, big fan of Antoine Hunter's work. Uh, we've, I've produced him in shows and we've worked together a lot often. Wonderful man, wonderful man. Um, um, I wanted to, there was one thing I wanted to say a while ago about providing closed captioning. And you have, um, be, somebody might be able to read, some people might not be able to read and understand English because ASL is their language. So don't think because you throw up closed captioning, you don't need to do the ASL. It's just, you know, another point, especially if it's something for kids, you know. So that's just a point. Uh, also, um, things don't have to be sign interpreted synchronously. So I had an event where none of the participants needed sign language, but we recognized we wanted to share it in a space for an asynchronous audience and who knows what their needs will be. And um, so our interpreter was like, we can't make it in the morning with you, but what we can do is we can interpret the video. Um, and so that ended up creating just another level of excitement. I hadn't realized that was an option. And I got very <laughs> excited about the fact that you can have work sign language interpreted at a different time period. That was a light bulb moment for me. 
Yeah, there's there's a lot going on now, with, especially with that, where people are doing an interview and then they give you the video and you have to come up with the script that the deaf person has signed and then you voice the deaf, what they said and then you, you also sign what the hearing person has interviewed the questions there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd really, I want to, um, I'd love to see what some of you guys are doing. Sabrina, it sounds like you're, you're on the cutting edge there. At least you know what's going on a lot. And uh, so, Nothing yeah, you know. Now, okay. though, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, as we are, um, we're going to be closing ourselves out in just the next couple of minutes. So I did want to make sure we had a look at these um, visual ways of communicating to the audience what the access services are. Um, I feel like it's really important for us to keep in mind that when we're when we're developing new practices for an audience that we have potentially been excluding for an extended amount of time, communicating to them that we're actually going to be accessible, that takes, that's a communication that takes place over time. Potentially, it needs to take place over several different uh, platforms. And some iconography is super, super useful. Um, I, are there any final questions or final observations in our last five minutes together? I would just like to say that I have access to a professional um, award. Did she win the award or at least was nominated for audio description for, for theater, for, for um, film? So, um, Antoinette, is that her name? But oh, I, ha I, I have access to her. I met her a couple of times. so great. Yeah. So we might need, to, if you need something like that, maybe we can get her. Uh, audio description. I love that. Yes. No, she's she's like the queen, the state of the art with that. So well, I, I already have my girl who I think is the best. She's based out of Portland and she does audio descriptions for um, um, for Alice Wong's uh, dis disability, dis dis div 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 disability. Messing up the name of her podcast. And now I'm going disvisibility. Exactly. That's what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that if we can, if we can have multiple folks here, that would be amazing. Does anybody else know any really great uh, audio describers? Okay. All right. We're going to have a party. I'm super excited. I am here for it. Any final questions around sign interpretation in a digital frame. I gotta say, I'm really deeply excited about the learnings you're gonna be making. What was the name of your partner, Mona Jean, that you're working with? Um, Moxie, well, um, Marsha Coles Felix. Marsha Coles Felix, but Moxie. And, Moxie. and, and, and yeah. what's the name of the company? Virtual Lingual. Virtual Lingual, deeply excited about Virtual Lingual and yeah. all of the learnings Virtual Lingual is going to be making. And how do we connect with Virtual Lingual? Like, how do we, because I'm like, oh, I want to I wanna find out and follow what Virtual Lingual is going to be doing and figure out how to support that. Well, um, I'm putting our, it's uh, right now, because our website is, uh, hasn't been built yet, I just put our, we were using a Gmail um, uh, access. So uh, we can start our email list and everything there. Please connect with us there. We'd love to work with you guys. We're really going to try to make sure that our interpreters have, uh, you know, good training, good equipment, good access, and um, and and make sure that we can access the needs of our clients. Mm. And we're both really artsy, so, and she, you know, I don't know, the National Poetry Slam would always go to a different uh, city every year. And so every year, I'm going into a different city, I don't know anybody in Madison, West Palm Beach, Boston, whatever, and I would try to get an interpreter to join me on stage to do slam poetry. And slam poetry is horrific, and it's just, you know, they want to do a seven minute poem in three minutes and it's just all this words, 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 and, um, and you don't get any prep for it. You know, you can, I, the first, I don't know, three or four years, I would like 
hey poets, if you want to give me your poems ahead of time, that'd be rocking, you know, and and I'd put out the box or something, you know, I'd get four. This is out of 76 teams of five poets to a team, you know. Indeed. So, um, um, but um, it's really hard to get someone to do that. And once I found Moxie about four or five years ago, she was like, but she was brave enough. She came up, she rocked it. I love this woman. And now we're like, the sister from another mother. And we're just, and now she wants to do this whole virtual lingual business. She already has an interpreting business for theater, but she wants to do this one. And she's like, come on, girl, we're going to do this. I'm like, okay, sure. So that's what we're going to do. So we'd love to help everybody. Please connect with me. I'll, I'm here for you. And, that, and that's kind of my point about you want the interpreter. If you can find an interpreter with a soft heart who um, doesn't, isn't desperate for money um, and can give, you know, pro bono kind of stuff. I, I, hope, I, I appreciate you saying that, but I'm interrupting only because I think that we're attempting to manifest a reality where this work doesn't have to be done pro bono. I'm yeah. really tired of living and working inside these mm -hmm. constructs that make accessibility something that isn't a core, uh, a core cost that's just budgeted for and is basic. It's really ridiculous. I go, oh, it means a, a lot of us are producing lemons. We're producing work that's literally non-functional for a gigantic portion of the community, but that's the expectation and that's how we're resourced. So I want to say yes to the to the feelings and the instincts of generosity. Yes to that. But also I'm not I'm not trying to make a new field where that's necessary. Let's build a field where we don't have to do that. You know what, this job. Is what we I'm need gonna get off my soapbox and okay, well, close out the just... meeting. This was so beautiful. I love you all. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your smart ideas. Thank you for everything you dropped in the links. I mean, all the links you dropped in the chat. Super, super helpful. Um, giving you all um, good vibes for the rest of the week. And as always, I'm going to hit stop on the recording. Goodbye, asynchronous community. Goodbye. Good luck, good luck, good luck, and let's work together.